So first of all, I want to say thank you very, very much uh, to Professor Chen Jinhua for the invitation to come here. I also would very much like to thank the Glory Sun Foundation for sponsoring these events. And I'm going to show up a slide here in a moment of a whole bunch of other people that I would like to thank. But first, the title, since that's kind of important. What do East Asian Buddhists call their books and why is the focus today. And I want to thank Carol for helping with this wonderful image, which I'm actually going to explain uh, shortly. So a lot of people are involved in this kind of research, and I think it's been three years since I've seen Jinhua and in person, and that we've, I've been able to come to UBC campus, and it's a real pleasure to be here. But of course, this kind of research requires really global uh, um, contributions and networking, and I think Frog Bear really is a part of that. So I really want to thank Professor Chen Jinhua, uh, Vicky, uh, Carol, and then a number of other scholars who have helped me over the years uh, mostly in Japan, but uh, also in Germany as well, and Professor Stefan Duhl, who of course is part of our Frog Bear Network as well. So the main question here is, what do East Asian Buddhists call their books and why? This is actually a pretty big problem, because when we think of religion, uh, we always think of Bibles. And for very good reason, I'm speaking in English, and of course the one book in the English language that we don't capitalize is the Bible. It's, it's a solitary book though, it's a codex originally. Um, and so we think of that one book that we can put in our hand. And when we think of a survey of world religious uh, scholarship, mostly since the late 19th century, what we're thinking of is the ways in which mostly scholars in the West, Europe, North America, thought of looking at different world religions and dividing up the different books. And I could have put up a slide here thinking about the uh, Sacred Books of the East by Max Mueller. Well, of course, this is a two-way street. So in the 19th century, when specifically Protestant Christians uh, were expending tremendous energy in China, they, of course, needed a name for the Bible. And in Japanese, of course, we call the Bible Seiten and Chinese Shengdian. <clears throat> Excuse me, the key word there is Sheng, of course, which is sage or venerable. However, if you think of contemporary Mandarin, or even Japanese for that matter, uh, Seike, for example, or Shengjing often refers to something Christian. And so that, that can be quite significant. Now, when we move over to the Japanese pronunciation, and I'm gonna be working between Japanese and Chinese here, whether we pronounce that first character say or shou is very important. Now, to be fair, if you stay in a hotel room in most places in Asia, specifically Japan, Hong Kong, you will find the Bukkyo Dendo Kyokai, uh, the Bukkyo Seiten, which would be the Buddhist Bible in one volume but I don't think that that has anything to do with most Buddhists. And of course, that's a Shinshu book. We also can think about the idea that in Chinese or even Japanese, we can think of Jingtian or Kyoten, which would be, for example, Bukkyo no Kyoten or something like that, many scriptures. But what I'm getting at here is, is what do the Buddhists call their books? And, and how can we think about that in history? Now, of course, the Buddhists don't have one book. If they do, often people think about the Xinjing, uh, the Prugna Paramita Hidya, or the Heart Sutra, okay? That's a book that we can usually see uh, in one particular uh, wall or something like that, but that's not the only Buddhist book. Now, if we go into this terminology a little bit more carefully, what we're going to find is those Protestant Christians in the 19th century, specifically Joseph Edkins and others, spent quite a bit of time thinking about ways in which to refute the teachings of Buddhism based on their relatively deep knowledge of Chinese culture. And Joseph Edkins, uh, in the middle of the 19th century, published Shi Jiao Jiang Yu, and this is the correction of Buddhist errors. Notice that he calls Buddhism Shi Jiao, okay? Now that obviously comes from the Chinese transliteration Shi Jiao Mo Ni, and we do see it in some pre-modern Japanese source, uh, excuse me, Chinese sources, very specifically these two catalogs, the Kaiyuan Shi Jiao Lu and the Zhenyuan Xinding Shi Jiao Lu. Now those are both Tang Dynasty, but you'll notice that we have Shi Jiao there. I believe that that's a significant development that occurred at that time and is something that played on through the ages on the continent. Now Seikyo is often used today to refer to a Christian Bible or Christianity, but again, some Chinese Buddhists in the 19th century and some in the early 20th century would use the term shi jiao to refer to Buddhism. But what about books? The issue is the canon. 
And we use this word often in Buddhist studies. And when we think about East Asian literature, specifically in Sinitic, that would be classical Chinese, literary Chinese, that of course is used by Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and Vietnamese Buddhists. Now, Buddhists have a lot of books. And as we love to tell our students, they've got more books than all the rest of the religions put together. And of course, the biggest book on earth is the uh, Great Perfection of Wisdom, uh, which of course was translated by Xuanzang that I'm gonna be talking about here in a minute. But when we use the word canon in English, we're usually, usually tying that to a gigantic collection of books. And specifically, again, that Kaiyuan Lu, that is the catalog to a canon, if you will, a list of 1,046 books in 5,048 Jin or rolls. It was updated in 800 with the Jinyuan Lu that I just mentioned, with 1,206 individual books in order, 5,351 Jin. But this is not an age of digitization. This is a lot of books. How are you gonna carry those things around? How are you gonna use them? So my question is, what about Buddhist books not included or indexed, indexed here in the 8th and 9th century? What about those books? What also did and do Buddhists call their precious books, those that are most important to them, instead of these thousands of books? Well, the term that comes up in Japan is shogyo. It's shengjiao. And this is not something that we see very much in Chinese Buddhist scholarship. And I'm going to address that towards the end of the talk. But the main issue here is Sheng Jiao and its meaning and where it comes from. Now, the term probably comes from, and I'm going to show you quickly here in a moment, a, uh, the usage that seems to pop up quite significantly in a number of translations by the infamous Xuanzang and his translation team, because he didn't work alone and one of his disciples, Kui Ji. Now, we also see it, I don't think surprisingly, in the writings of Chengguan, one of the most significant Buddhist exegetes or scholar monks who lived 738 to 839, so about 100 years later. We do see the term Shengjiao in their writings. And my supposition, following some Japanese scholarship I'm going to show you in a moment here, is that they probably were trying to target an Indic linguistic term like the Sanskrit Arya Shasana. Now, Sheng could mean something like Arya. Arya in Sanskrit literally means noble, as in Aryan or Aryan in usual uh, North American speech. Shasana literally means teachings or doctrines. But as you're going to see here in a moment, the term is used in Xuanzang's writings, as well as Kuiji, as well as in Chengguan, to mean books. And these books contain important teachings that something that would not necessarily need to be construed in such a large way as the English word canon, or the Chinese, Yichie Jing, all the scriptures, Isaikyo in Japanese, or Da Zhang Jing, which really means big library. And we'll show you that in a moment, let alone that strange terminology of Sanzang or Tripitaka. Now in Japan, the term Shogyo persists and on the East Asian continent, as I, moment, as I said a moment ago, it really seems to have been discarded. Now, if you happen to spend enough time in Buddhist studies programs, you might have seen this list. I don't think this is an especially useful list for how Buddhists would walk around and talk about their books. We do know in a number of Tang Dynasty and slightly earlier compilations that coming out of India, there are many classifications of Buddhist texts. Everything from Sutra to Vyakarana to Avadana to Jatakas to Vaikulya to Upadesha. But we really don't need to key it so closely to the Sanskrit, even though Shenzhen, Kuiji, and others may have been interested in this. As a side note, this term, the 12 divisions of the canon, or Fanjing, shows up relatively often in Chan Buddhist texts to refer to kind of an overuse of all the scriptures. So I think it has pejorative connotations. Now, where do I get Buddha Shasana or Arya Shasana? Because of course, we don't know what Xuanzang was exactly thinking. And it's very difficult to line up his translations accurately with any kind of uh, extant Sanskrit or Tibetan text, although Buddhist scholars like to do this, but getting it line by line is quite difficult. So we can look at Bukyo Go, for example, or Hirakawa's dictionary, and most of them suggest that it's probably Shasana for teachings, or Buddha, or Arya. The other one I want to throw out there is Agama, for those of you who might know a little Sanskrit. 
The Agamas also are a type of texts in India that often mean teachings too. And we see uh, Vishnu or Vaish Vaishnavite Agamas as well as Shaivite Agamas. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because these individuals translated and wrote a lot of books, but I'm just gonna go quickly here and show you that in the infamous Tatan Shiyuji, which of course is not actually written by Xuanzang, it's written by, compiled by BNT. And of course, it's difficult to tie Xuanzang to any one text. Nonetheless, uh, in, a, in a widely available translation, uh, Li Rongxi translates, formerly it was said to be 40 Li, 30 Li, while in Buddhist texts, the Yojana, it was counted as only 16 Li. But notice the Chinese here is Sheng Jiao. So there he's gonna translate it as Buddhist texts. Not too many lines down on the three seasons of the year in India and, and the, vars uh, the Varsha, the, the retreat, he says, according to the holy teachings, now in English, of the Buddha, the monks of India observe the summer retreat during the rainy season, either in the earlier three months or the later three months. So Li Rong, she's got a little wiggle room here. He's got noble here for Sheng, but he can tell that Xuanzang is using, or Bianji is using something similar here for Sheng Jiao. If you search this in C beta, you're gonna find 20 examples, almost identical to this, referring to the Buddhist texts as Sheng Jiao. So why didn't they use Tripitaka, Sutra, Vinaya, Shastra, Jing, Yu, Lun? If you do a little more searching, as we all can today, you will find everything C beta ties to Xuanzang, you will find 793 examples across his translations and other texts. So he and his team really like this term. And needless to say, I don't have time to go through them all, but they're very similar. Kuiji, his disciple, loves it even more. He doesn't write as much. And we've got 319 examples, specifically coming from the Chengwei Shiluan Shuji, the narrative notes to the Vinyakti Matrata Siddhi Shastra, which is a very, very important text in Buddhist studies. And it turns out, perhaps in the way some Buddhists thought about their texts. Chengguan cites the term 268 times, according to the Sibeta search. So we're talking about a lot here. And one of the most famous commentaries in the East Asian Buddhist tradition is Huayan Jing Yan Chao. This thing, he has it in there a number of times. And you don't have to trust me, I'll give you two examples. So here we simply have Kui Ji giving us a nice little definition of Sheng Jiao. And we obviously have Cheng Guan doing the same thing. I'll just paraphrase for you, Buddhist texts. Okay, over here, we think they're more sutras. Over here, there's a little bit of Arya. Nonetheless, Buddhist texts, Buddhist texts. We don't say canon, we don't go in that direction. We use Buddhist texts. And I would guess that there, there's an Indic basis behind this. You should also know that it would appear that the Tang Royal Court understood this. We obviously know from Japanese manuscripts, as well as some Dunhuang texts, that most of the manuscript versions of Xuanzang's translations had these prefaces on them. They're lost in all printed canons. But we have the first preface, preface which is the Da Tang Sanzang Sheng Jiao Xu, which was uh, written in 648 by Emperor Taizong followed regarding the 657 texts he brings back. And then of course, we also have the preface, the Sheng Ji, which was compiled, which was apparently written by Emperor Gaozong as well. So again, Sheng for texts, Sheng for Buddhism, Sheng Jiao for the important texts. Now what's going on down here, I'm gonna be picking up shortly, which is the transmission of these texts down to today. There's a third preface just for fun, by Emperor Zhongzong as well, where he's got the same name, he's got Sheng Jiao. So again, Buddhist texts. There is a tremendous legacy as I'm about to show you. Oh, back, absolutely. Anytime. This is a, this is a Dunhong text, by the way. Missing dragon long between Zhong and Xing. I'm not sure. Oh, because I believe the note has that <coughs> on it, but that could be wrong. Thank you. I think, in other words, obviously over here it's Da Tang Zhong Xing San Zhang. Yep, so that would be my mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. Long Xing. 
I think the note says that there should be a lung there, but anyway, I'll double check it. Nonetheless, this is on some Dunhuang texts and some of our copies of Tang manuscripts that we have in Japan. Now by 1200 at the, at the latest, most large Buddhist monastery and temple libraries, librarians in Japan, use the term shogyo to index their own books. They did use the word canon, and they did use the word commentary, and they did use the word vinaya, but they specifically singled out shogyo, shengjiao. And we see this in Shingon, Tendai, Nara temples, as well as Pure Land, and what I'm going to go ahead and call Tendai offshoots. Now, as I told the graduate students at lunch today, I realize if you're going to move into Japanese, it's nice to have the kanji. So I believe I have it in most places. But we're talking about some very, very large collections in Yakuji, Miidera, Kofukuji, Todaiji, Saidaiji, and elsewhere. But this is the more important part, and I think the future research. As that original picture I, I showed you, all the way up until the 19th century, we have the Shinshu, the Jodo Shinshu, also compiling. Shogyo. But here we have Shogyo with glossing, kana, gloss. So in other words, they're even going to use the term to index their own books, and they're way outside the canon. They don't really keep the canon very often in most Jodo Shinshu temples. And again, this particular edition I'm showing you behind Kueji. This is a, a Kofukuji picture of Kueji that I borrowed. Uh, and then, of course, it has this, uh, the actual uh, Shinshu Kana Shogyo Kanten Roku behind it. So 1856, this is on the verge of where we usually think of modernity in East Asia. Now this does creep into the West. Nanjo Bunyu's famous catalog to the Buddhist canon published in 1883 in Oxford, you can see the, the Chinese title here and the English. He's got Sanzang Shengjiao, but of course Nanjo Bunyu didn't know, know Chinese. So he would say, Damyo Sanzo Shogyo Mokuroku. So he's inserted shogyo here. One wonders why. Does this follow some tradition coming out of China or not? And by the way, if you're wondering if he's a Shinshu monk, Shinshu Nanjo Bunyu. So again, the Shinshu connection here. And this takes us right into thinking about contemporary Buddhist studies in Japan. Now, Takakusu Junjiro, Watanabe Kaikyoku, and others did a gargantuan amount of editing with very large teams to give us the Buddhist canon that most of us are familiar with, the Taisho Shinju Daizokyo. This is what we see in C beta or SAT. And of course, it's a very strange compilation, but it is these individuals that, of course, put it together, typeset it, and cross checked it against other editions. What they also produced. Uh, a few years after the publication of the original Taisho is the Showa Hobo So Mokuroku, which is three volumes of all the catalogs that were produced, not just for the production of the Taisho, but all the rest of the indexing that had occurred since the Meiji period in Japan. So it will not surprise you to know this very easy to find book, UBC Library has it, is covered with Shogyo that individuals were pulling out of Japanese libraries. Further from this, we need to remember that in contemporary scholarship, all the books outside the canon, meaning Taisho, are in the Daini Honzoku Zokyo, but they didn't come from nowhere, strange English. The point is they were compiled from the same temples I'm about to go through, specifically looking at the texts that are not indexed according to those catalogs. Todaiji, Kofukuji, Toji, Daigoji, Tofukuji, Keninji, and Chionin. These are massive temple libraries that we have indexed. And the librarians at these temple libraries index their own books using Shogyo, as I'm going to show you. Now, these are actual pages of my copy because I don't believe there's an online version of this. But what you're gonna see is simply the list. This is volume one. And of course it has 20 catalogs. And I've simply gone through here on the left there's the Toji Kyozo Isai Kyo Mokuroku, right there. It's the Nanzenji Kyozo Isai Kyo Mokuroku. Kyozo is a library, okay? Um, and then we have the Kami Daikoji Isai Kyo Mokuroku. We've got the Chionin. That's Kami Daigo. That's Chionin. We have the infamous Shosoin collection for those of us that like our truly rare manuscripts, which was available 100 years ago, not on DVD, but we had it. 
and of course, Ishiyamadera, but they're all indexing the Isai Kyo, the canon first, just the canon, tied in this particular case to the catalog, the genuine loop. So not any of the extra books. And notice they don't use Shogyo. Now, in case you're thinking I'm making this up, anybody that actually picks up a physical book of the Taisho, you'll find these notes all over it. And there's that funny little blue uh, highlighted all over the C beta and SAT does a pretty good job too. So what exactly are all those numbers? The e Taisho editors indexed the Korean canon to everything we just saw. That's how they got their texts. But that's the canon. We also see in volume two that some other interesting catalogs that tell us something about the state of Buddhism about a hundred years ago and what people called their books. So we have the canon. And then of course, we also have the first study of the Korean canon. We've got a fascinating Yuan dynasty catalog that's lost anywhere else. So where was it preserved? In China? Nope, Japan. That's why we have it. And that of course is the Zhi Yuan Fa Bao Kan Tong Zong Lu. We've got two different Ming canons right there and there. And what do we start to see? Shogyo. So we wonder why are we starting to see Shogyo here? Is this something the Japanese are adding or the Chinese are adding? And then of course the infamous Obaku canon that Nanjo Bunyu uh, produces a catalog to in 1883. Now, now we're gonna have some fun with Shogyo. So here, what we're looking at are most of the same libraries, Toji, Ishiyamadera, Ninaji, Tofukuji, elsewhere, but we've got lots and lots and lots of shogyo because we're not looking at the canon. We're not looking at the stuff that's too hard to cart around and you might not necessarily read, but you might. We're looking at the books Buddhists actually care about. And specifically, we've got the Toji, Kanchi In, Shogyo, Mokuroku. We've got the Ishiyamadera, Zouchu Shogyo Mokuroku, Ninaji, which has a particularly large collection. And we also have some Zen texts from, from, from Tofukuji, which don't say Shogyo, interestingly enough. And finally, we have Yakshiji and Nara. But Shogyo, 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 Shogyo. What they're doing is showing you that at the same time they're producing the Taisho catalog, these guys are indexing the same libraries, but they've separated the books the books that are important to the Japanese Buddhist shogyo and the stuff that's in the canon. It's not that it's not important, it's just not as important. Now, we're talking about a gigantic network of libraries in Japan across a relatively small area. Ninaji, I mentioned, Toji, Daigoji, Shinpukuji, which is in Nagoya, Kongoji, I've spent a lot of time working on in Southern Osaka, Kanshinji, Negoroji, and then Kongobuji and Shochi in on Mount Koya. Now I do this to point out, this is a Google map I did in 2021. The reference here is 20 kilometers. They're very close to each other. So one would expect that if Shogyo is over here and Shogyo is over here, they might actually share books. They might actually have ideas about what Shogyo are. So that's what we're looking at here. By the way, Kofukuji and Todai, Todaiji's Tonanin are also in Nara. So what do we know? We know that historically, a Chinese, Japanese, and Korean Buddhist temple probably, probably had a copy of the canon printed, Da Zangjing, Dai Zokyo, or in the Kyozo, or the Zangjing, the library. But they probably didn't touch it very much. They may, might not have even read it. There's more than a thousand texts. Secondly, they had their own books written, written by their ancestors, their peers. They had secular poetry books education texts that were often indexed according to the Chanzo One, the thousand character classic. In Japan, these books were cataloged in chests that have survived. So category two is chests in Japan. We can see them, we can touch them to keep the bugs and the humidity out. By 1769, it appears that almost all Japanese Buddhist traditions were using the term shogyo and the chests. Similarly, Shingon, Tendai, Jodo Shinchu, Zen, most traditions were doing it keeping books that were Chinese, books that were Japanese, and books that were somewhere in between. That's what we're gonna see in a moment. Now, someone actually did all the work for us to find this material. His name is Ugai Tetsujo. You saw his name earlier when I mentioned that he had this debate with Joseph Edkins about the true teachings of Buddhism. He gives us lists 
In the 19th century of all the different manuscript canons, the prefaces, the postscripts, the printed materials, and he gives us an excellent summary of just about everything that was in Japan before the era, about 1868 to 1874, when the government wanted to outlaw most of this. It didn't work or we wouldn't have the Taisho. Now, to me, what is most fascinating here is when we're looking at the history of the book in East Asia, and here, what I'm really doing is following Yamamoto Nobuyoshi's research, because he makes an excellent point on page one. When we think about the study of books and libraries, we usually think about Egypt and Babylon, and perhaps even uh, notions of, of Baghdad, or perhaps even the Vatican. We almost never include Japan. And yet Japan has an enormous number of manuscripts and texts. And just indexing our Shochi in from Mount Koya, he breaks them down in categories. Important manuscripts and documents from the Nara through Edo period, Shahon or Monjo, manuscript and printed texts from Shingon Tendai traditions, teachings texts, educational materials, Chinese books, Kanseki, books in Chinese, they're always labeled as such, Japanese, Kokusho, and Kana books. So again, three kinds of texts. Shogyo have books in Japanese, books that are glossed with kana, because they're not necessarily kanbun and they're not necessarily Japanese. And then of course, kanseki, books in Chinese. He also says that at this particular library, we have different printed editions of important texts, not the whole canon, but if you're gonna print a text that really matters to you and you're gonna share it with all your friends, it's shogyo. I want you to start guessing which text I'm probably gonna pull out and show you circulated. We also have Muromachi era hand copied text with colophon. So we have the history of libraries here. Okay, across time. I don't have to break this up. Uh, the Shochin mostly still stands uh, as opposed to some of the other libraries that we see in this particular area. Now he points out that uh, Yamamoto Sensei argues there's 15 categories of Shogyo. I'm about to show you a whole lot more than that because it turns out modern scholars looking at the resources that a hundred years ago people had while we were making the Taisho and the catalogs to all the Shogyo we found all kinds of other materials that pre-modern authors had broken into different types of texts to show what's important to them. For example, a ritual text, a doctrinal text, a teaching text, something else. We also can see nine temples did independent printing, not the canon, but the text that mattered. Koya, Negoroji, Toji, Kofukuji, Todaiji, Saidaiji, Pure Land temples, and they collect Sung editions probably as early as a thousand years ago. Now, shogyo could be translated as sacred teachings documents if you wanna keep it just in, in the Sinitic sphere. And so in the Shingon tradition, here's the list again. We've got lots and lots of Shingon libraries with beautiful collections. We've got some Shingon Ritsu libraries as well. Tendai, not as much as survived because obviously Nobunaga burned Hiei, but we do have the Shorenin Kisuizo, which is a very nice collection of a small temple in Kyoto. And we've got a lot of Shin, Pure Land, even Hokkeishu texts, Shogyo in Japan. Now between the 1980s and the 2010s, mostly the Shingon library started to be cataloged and studied in Japan widely, but there's a lot more work left to be done. And down here, of course, um, uh, Kamikawa Michio, Abe Yasuro, Goto Akio. These are some of, of the really groundbreaking scholars working on this material. I'm going to go through these relatively quickly to show you the results of what they've produced. This was in 96. This was out. This is 2023. So they break six basic categories of shogyo. They find in Shingon temples, Tendai temples, other kinds of temples, six main categories. Doctrinal study, ritual documents, historical documents, language study documents, transmission documents, other. Here's category one, just one. Hand copied scriptures, printed scriptures, commentaries, cursive debate, these are my translations, cursive debate texts, records of questions and responses during debates, hand copied notes, draft lectures, religious lectures, written lectures, written records of lectures. So whatever my teacher told me, I have to copy it down and I need to keep a copy. And you keep a colophon of that. That's just the doctrinal study, Kyogaku. Ritual documents, instruction manuals only. 
Ritual manuals, ritual instructions, shidai, in order. Glosses, preparation instructions, enlightenment experiences, detailed diaries. And the C and the J are showing you how they break them into Chinese, kanseki, Japanese, and kana, glossed. I'm not going to spend too much time, just going to show you. Here's all the other ritual documents. Sanskrit gata, ritual music shomyo, extremely important category within the Tendai tradition as well as others. Regulations, lecture plans, register of Buddha's names to be recited during funerals. Buddhist books, historical documents, language study documents, siddham, Sanskrit, dictionaries, annotated books of pronunciation and meaning from Chinese Buddhist books. Now, I'm going to ask it again. Guess which book I'm going to come back and show you circulates widely here. Transmission documents and, of course, catalogs, because these pre-modern authors cataloged everything. They kept it in chess, they kept lists, and they updated those things to show you that they weren't going to be lost and probably in programs of study. Now, we don't have anything like this for China. So why did Japanese monastic libraries stick with the term shogyo? Why'd they use that for doing this? My guess is that the major monastery temple libraries kept the canon, as I said, and the chests. But I think that they also kept copies not of the printed canon, but of printed, usually text not cataloged inside the canon that then they were going to use for instruction and daily use in addition to hand copy texts, just like we would see in the secular world. Chinese historians, Japanese historians, and Korean historians talk about this throughout the Qing dynasty, certainly, and Edo Japan. There's the text. Kuiji's Chengwei Shiluan Shuji actually circulates rather widely in Shingon temples, Tendai temples, but not any edition of it, a beautifully printed edition of his main commentary to the Vignapti Matrata Siddhi Shastra, a very important arcane text. We see this very specifically cataloged in the Shingon Library of Amanosan Kongoji and the Shochiin down on Mount Koya. Reading Kweiji's commentaries. And what does Kweiji talk about explicitly in his commentary? Shogyo. This is a copy not of the text I want, but it's an image of uh, a Kasuga ban, a Kasuga uh, Kofukuji edition of the Vignati Matra Tasidi Shastra, the Chengwe Shilun itself. And you can see it's beautiful, very, very nicely printed, but Kweiji's commentary exists as well. I just don't have a digitized copy. Circulating outside the canon, way apart from the canon, obviously labeled as Shogyo, an important book the Buddhists would use. Now, what might have happened to this term shogyo on the East Asian continent? I think I've slightly overwhelmed you with documentation from Japan. We can see it, we can taste it, we can touch it back down through the centuries, pretty much all the way to the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries. So what happens on the continent? It's very, very slim pickets. We can look to Uichan. Wee Chun is this very, very important Korean traveler who goes to Northern Song, China, and he brings back this beautiful catalog. And I don't speak Korean, so I'm not going to try to pronounce it. But the Kyo Zhang, I believe is how you say it. Obviously, the Jiao Zhang in Chinese is this beautiful catalog he brings back, not of the canon, but of all the different uh, commentaries he finds in China, and he wants to collect. Uh, collect. Now, he's particularly in interested in Chengguan, not surprisingly, told us about shogyo, loves the term shogyo. Nonetheless, does Wee Chun use the term shogyo? No, he doesn't. We see it nowhere in this very important text. In fact, here, what we see is that role one consists of commentaries to sutras, jing. Role two, indices to commentaries, vinaya, yu, shu, not so surprising. So we're getting into our tripitaka here, even by the time of Wee Chun. So it would appear that sometime between Shenzhen, Kuiji, Chengguan, we've moved over to Sanzang, Tripitaka, or maybe even Dazang Jing, as I'm going to talk about in a minute, on the continent. And this is, of course, Wei Chun visiting Song, China, and then, of course, Lun Shu, the Nonso, the commentaries, the Shastra. But nonetheless, we've got a thousand different texts here. There's lots of different editions, but guess where Wei Chun's catalog is preserved? Not in China, not in Korea but in Japan. 
So it turns out that the same individuals that were cataloging their own books also were particularly obsessive about different editions at some of these very important libraries, specifically Toji, Ninaji, of Wee Chun's catalog. Now, Ninaji is what I mentioned before, and there's a number of books in here that are not mentioned in any canon. And so this becomes a very important record for the Koreans, obviously, around the 11th century. But going forward, what about China? I mean, China is the place where obviously Kuiji, Xuanzang, and thousands of other monks are working, circulating, and the Japanese are very interested in connecting back to China. Well, we know that in Japan in particular, and also in China, we talk about revolving sutra bookcases where you put the canon inside. That's the canon, not the books that you might use on an everyday basis. So do we have any textual discussion of this? Do we see shogyo, shengjiao anywhere? Not much. Now, I have not done an exhaustive study, but I've gone back to as close as I can get in extant materials, because I don't think Ming is particularly helpful or I haven't gotten there yet. But for example, the Shu Xin Yi Zhen Yuan Shi Jiao Lu doesn't use Sheng Jiao. It's not looking at it. Other Song Dynasty texts, specifically ones authored by individual monks who visit a lot of libraries, the most bibliocentric individual I've ever heard of in Chinese history is Zhu Fan Hui Hong in his Shiman Wenzetan. Qi Song in his Tanjin Wenji, very, very wordy text, individual writings. You'd think he'd mention it too. Neither of them do. How about Ben Jiu's Shi Shi Tong Jian? By the time we get into what would be Southern Song, Yuan period, Ming, then we're into our Shi, Shi Jiao Mo Ni de Shi. So it would appear that we're already starting to see a change on the continent, at least in China. And there's other texts I can go through. But suffice it to say that if we delve just for a moment and try your patience one more minute, what we're seeing here is a focus on libraries in these Northern Song texts. And we're gonna see Buddhist books referred to as the three baskets, uh, as in the Tripitaka. For example, uh, over on the left, we're obviously looking at Qi Sung, um, where he's got lots of allusions to the Sanzang, and he's talking about there the Sanzang, by the way, in uh, one of his texts is uh, Yoga Chara, uh, Abhidharma, and of course, something called the Lotan, which I think is the Fo Shua Lotan Jing. So he's not going to go straight there. But nonetheless, you can see this individuation there. It just doesn't seem to be systematized the same way as we already would have seen in Japan by the time of Qi Sung. We also see him using different terms for library. Jing Jiao, fascinating, seems to be a word for library. While just below it, he's got just Zhang. So there seems to be a slight change here in Chinese usage by the time of Qi Sung. We should also note that Shi Shi Tongjian uh, does list Buddhist books, and it even talks about a catalog. It's no longer really very extant. Uh, Yanagida Seizan in his Enseki Kaidai mentions it. Uh, the the four fa da ming lu, but again we don't see shogyo and it doesn't seem to to have the same kind of obsession with our books. Now, I'm going to say thank you, but I'm just going to conclude for a moment here. The main concern here is what the Buddhists call their books. I would argue they certainly don't call it the canon. I would argue that they do have to have a term in Chinese or Japanese or Korean or Vietnamese, and it's not going to be the canon and it's not going to be the Bible. So it certainly seems based on the Japanese case that it's shogyo. And in the Japanese in particular, looking back to Kueji and very specifically the learning tradition coming out of his lineage at Kofukuji and Nara seems to be very specifically tied to Sheng Jiao as something that may or may not have come out of the hands of Shenzang, Kuiji, and others. And it seems to be something stuck with all the way up to modernity and then picked up by Japanese Buddhist scholars in the late 19th and 20th centuries, as we just saw in the canon. It does start to fade out a little bit by the time we get to the 1950s, but that's a completely different lecture. But the key thing I hope I've been able to answer is what the Buddhists call their books. They don't call them Bibles, and I don't think they call them canons either. Thank you very much.